Well, hello, Coach. I am a guest on your podcast today, the Front Row Podcast, and uh, I thought we'd turn the tables and uh, I'd ask you a few questions. How's that sound? I like it. I think you're going to be good at this. Yeah, like I just said, you may have a new <laughs> career. You're going right into television after oh, this. Oh, man, don't jinx it. But uh, yeah, I certainly have loved getting to work with you and getting your podcast up and running, and uh, you've had some pretty phenomenal guests. I'm definitely consider myself at the bottom of the totem pole <laughs> who you have and who you have lined up but um yeah i think just all the the topics you've gotten to cover and the stories you've gotten to tell um have really been inspiring really been just showing people how they can get through hard situations i know mm -hmm. that's really your goal mm -hmm. for this uh platform and this podcast mm -hmm. um i'm going to start with your getting getting to work with kids your career of getting to work with athletes over the years, what did you think was the most important, what were the most valuable characteristics athletes could bring to a team? Well, I think there's so many things, you know, obviously hard work and, you know, you want young people to be ambitious and eager. And you love as a coach when you get young people that want to be coached, um, even at the highest level, you know, some of the greatest athletes in each sport. The great ones always want to be coached. Mm -hmm. They want somebody to critique them. They want somebody to be honest with them all the time. Break things down honestly to me. Where do I need to get better? What, what am I good at? What am I bad at? Mm -hmm. At the same time, I used to have a, a saying with our, our players that uh, I called them the three E's. Mm -hmm. um, enthusiasm, um, energy, and effort. And really, if you think about all three of those things, and you know, it's an easy thing to remember the three E's all the mm -hmm. time. And you know, enthusiasm is, is, is where you walk in the gym every day. You've got a pep in the step. You've got a bounce to you. You're, you're ready. You're willing. You're anxious. You can't wait. And you've got a smile on your face. It changes everything. Your, your energy level, you know, what kind of energy are you bringing throughout practice, throughout games, wh whatever it is you're doing. And then obviously effort. Mm -hmm. um, and, and effort is one of those things, I think, with athletes where athletes, again, they want honesty. And if they're not providing... Uh, the level of effort that's required, they want you to call them out. Yeah. Great players want that. You know, poor, bad players, poor players, underachievers, they run from it. They hide from it. But great players want it. They, mm -hmm. they have great enthusiasm. They have great energy. They have great effort, I think, all the time. And for me, I think that probably stands out more than anything. Yeah. I think the cool thing about those three E's is that they're all controllable. Mm -hmm. They're all in your control. My college coach... Oh, he had a saying he would always throw out there, E plus R equals O. Mm -hmm. An event plus your response mm -hmm. dictates the outcome. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that, that kids, you know, athletes of all ages nowadays can really lose sight of, is mm -hmm. that they really can have a huge say in the outcome of a situation based on the controllable, which is their yeah. response. And I, I think, again, players that I've coached, uh, and I've coached a lot of guys that have played in the NBA, and mm -hmm and been around a guy, a lot of players that have had great, great success. Great players, they're, they're like you said, there are some things you can't control. That those, that's part of life and, and sometimes part of athletics, part of games. Mm -hmm. But the things you can control, I can control my energy level, my effort level. I can control my enthusiasm. Yeah. I can walk in the gym and be the biggest downer where I drag my teammates down or I can have the greatest enthusiasm and I'm upbeat and I'm positive and I'm ready to go. And I think that has an effect. Mm -hmm. Uh, on everybody else in the gym or in the room or in whatever team you're on. And mm -hmm. so what really happens, I think, in sports is when your best player, mm -hmm. uh, the best player on a team, if the best player is a great practice player, if your best player has great enthusiasm, has great effort, has great energy, it opens the door for that team to or that organization to have unlimited and amazing success. I think when your best player though is not your best worker yeah. and they're, they have no enthusiasm, they don't, their effort isn't very good. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we all get fooled by their talent mm -hmm. and we think their talent is always going to overcome. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, um, th that's the thing that brings a team down is when you put so much stock into that one player and that one player is not delivering yeah. in those areas. One of my favorite stories that you tell about a player that you got to coach was uh, early days at UCLA. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong about mm -hmm. any of this. Um, but he was naturally gifted as a basketball player, very good at his craft for at a young age. 
Um, but he was really hard to coach and he was, I think you said it was difficult to be his teammate mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And so you had an opportunity to speak with coach Wooden about, you know, what do we do with this guy? Like he could mm -hmm. be a real asset to the team, mm -hmm. but he is also extremely difficult mm -hmm. at times. Mm -hmm. And coach Wooden said, well, the easiest thing would be to just kick him off the mm -hmm. team, but it's your job to coach mm -hmm. him. Yep. So how are you going to walk through that? Um, and so, yeah, what, what could you say on that to someone who's listening, who maybe has a really gifted athlete on their team, but is at times just really messing with the vibe of the team and just the culture overall? Well, I think number one, with those kind of players, um, I, I think you have to lay out a very clear, honest, uh, explanation of what the expectations are mm -hmm. of that person, of that player. Mm -hmm. And here are the expectations, and here's what we expect of you. And if you can't meet these expecta expectations, then there will be a consequence. And it may be just sitting on the bench. Hopefully, it's not going to be taking that person off the team. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, there's a way to get their attention to where they are going to recognize, okay, these are the expectations. They were laid out for me clearly. Mm -hmm. I agreed to them, or I understand them, mm -hmm. and I have to live up to that. Uh, you know, John Wooden also uh, told me one time, and uh, we had so many amazing conversations, but, you know, he said, Mark, the, the greatest ally that coaches don't use often enough is the bench. Mm, and, I love that. you know, sometimes, uh, you know, a good, a good uh, case of humble pie mm -hmm. is not bad, you know, yeah. to, to sit over there and watch. Yeah. And make a decision whether or not you want to be a part of what we're doing, yeah. whether we're... Winning, losing doesn't really matter, but for us to ultimately reach our potential, everybody has to be on the same page. And, and when your best player um, is is a problem, it's it's tough. And I, I don't I don't know that any of those teams, any any team I've been on, when the best player has has brought so much negativity to the rest of the the team, I don't, I don't think any of those teams have have succeeded at a high level yeah but we get fooled by it as times at coaches because we always see that talent and you're like Ooh, okay <laughs> if that guy will come along and sometimes he just never come along but you're always yeah. trying as a coach to, to to find that answer yeah yeah um well certainly i w i would think that through all of your years of coaching and and being a great success as a head coach you must have had some really great assistant coaches um uh, behind you and supporting <laughs> you and um, helping you with these kids, um, what would you say is the, the most valuable qualities to have in an assistant coach? Well, I think uh, I would always tell that I have told a lot of young coaches now, you know, uh, that I know that probably the most important thing you'll ever do is who you hire. Mm. Um, because that, that everything stems from that. Mm. Um, your recruiting in college athletics stems from that. It comes from who you hire. Uh, your philosophy and how you're going to play it comes from your assistants as well. Mm -hmm. But I think the most uh, important quality that you're looking for in an assistant coach is someone who understands the true, deep definition of loyalty. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes it's difficult, especially in today's age. You have social media and everybody has an opinion and everybody's easy to throw it out there. And it's out there quick and fast. And you might lose a game by the time you even get to the press conference or get in your car. There's all kind of opinions. Mm -hmm. And what you really need is your coaching staff mm -hmm. to have one heartbeat and to be one. And whether that's in coaching or in business or in life, you've got to have your group of people, which in sports, it's your coaching staff. Mm -hmm together mm -hmm. because there will be some great high moments and amazing things there's going to be some valleys and when you're in those valleys if you have somebody on your staff that's chirping away to the athletic director to the president or to the fans or whomever it may be or the players parents and the players parents are calling saying I don't understand why coach isn't playing my kid and they're on the phone going I don't really know either and I don't understand it either I'd play him if I was a head coach mm -hmm. but there's so many times I think where coaches um underestimate how valuable loyalty is on your staff being together mm -hmm. not uh, you know putting a knife in somebody's back and uh, I just think loyalty is a big thing yeah yeah um, well I know this topic of uh, NIL is uh, deep mm -hmm. and dark and mm -hmm. and uh, confusing and a little sticky right now 
Um, but something I've been thinking about recently in regards to this new wave of name, image, and likeness deals is the way of, I mean, the effect that it's going to have on various parts of mm-hmm. college athletics. But thinking about college basketball, thinking about March Madness, mm-hmm. just the most mm-hmm. fun thing to watch on television in March. Um, do you think that it's going to have any sort of effect on who we're seeing in the final four each year? Do you think at all it's going to cause the ties to shift to, you know, it's just building up, you know, sort of dynasties Mm -hmm. of teams that are just successful again and again and again? Or do you think it's actually going to give a chance for more, more programs, more teams to, you know, bring in top recruits? I think it's a great question. So I think when you talk about NIL and you're talking about the NCAA tournament, Mm -hmm. which by the way, I, I used to say this and I still say it, um, the Super Bowl's phenomenal. Um, you know, the NBA Finals are phenomenal. World Series is phenomenal, but nothing, nothing <laughs> comes close to the NCAA basketball tournament. I used I to agree. tell people all the time, I agree. it's the greatest show on earth, yeah. period. I don't care what it is out there. Everybody in America, whether it's the janitor, the secretary, the president, <laughs> this person, everybody has a pool. Everybody's filling out a bracket. Everybody's yeah. interested, in, especially yeah. those first few weekends, and you've got the, the, the smaller schools playing the bigger schools yeah. and yep. you know the mid-major playing the high major, upsets. and everybody's upsets, and yeah. uh, they're, they're glued to the television. So it's yeah. the greatest it's the greatest show on earth, yeah. period, bar none. <laughs> and, uh, and I was able to be a part of it, so I'm so thankful for that. At the same time, what I think is going to happen, I think it's, we're going to watch it here in the next few years, mm-hmm. the traditional kind of blue bloods, which we would say the programs that have kind of been at the top for a long time, yeah. they still have the best chance. Mm-hmm. But I think what happens is because of NIL, because of the transfer portal, oh yeah, that is part. and those two things are going on at the exact same time, Yeah. so there are schools uh, that may be just right underneath those top programs that have a chance to get a better player, mm-hmm. um, maybe through the transfer portal where the kids don't have to sit out anymore. Mm-hmm. Maybe uh, there's NIL money mm-hmm. uh, there for them that maybe wasn't at the big school. Maybe at the bigger school they had to push more money to one of some of their better players. I think that everything to do with name, image, and likeness in general mm-hmm. is a good thing. I coached Ed O'Bannon, and Ed O'Bannon at UCLA is the one that really kind of got the ball rolling for – Everything that's happening right now with the NIL and and Ed, every guy in America, every college kid in America that's making money right now, mm-hmm. ought to send Ed O'Bannon a thank you note. He got it <laughs> he done. He was the one he saw himself kind of uh, mimicked in a video game. So Ed was playing. Ed played for us at UCLA. We won a national championship in 1995, and years later he's playing EA Sports with his buddies and. Mm-hmm. They've got this 95 UCLA basketball team. And and even though the names weren't on the back of the jerseys, like he was number 31. So there's this tall, slender black guy, left-handed, shot just like him. And he's in the video. And we all know it's Ed, but but they don't mention Ed's name. And so finally his buddy says, well, Ed, how much do you get for being in the game? And it's, I don't get anything. Mm -hmm. And therein began the beginning of Ed beginning to form a group that ultimately sued the NCAA. Mm. NCAA was making all that money from EA Sports and the NCAA tournament. And then uh, that lawsuit went all the way to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Mm -hmm. college athletics, athletes being able and allowed to uh, use their name, image, and likeness Mm -hmm. for their own personal gain. And so the good thing is college athletes have the ability to, to, to do that. Yeah. The, the, yeah. the unintended consequence of the NIL is we understand that Bryce Young, the quarterback at Alabama, Dr. Pepper wants to put him on a national television commercial and pay him you know, half a million dollars or whatever. We get that. We understand. But now every athlete wants to get paid, and every yeah. athlete's expecting money. Whether they're the 13th guy, they're the last guy right. sitting down on the bench, they're just like, hey, coach, I have some money for me somewhere, right? Right, right. And now schools have created these things called collectives where they're raising money, and then the collective can have an autograph signing and pay the players, and, mm-hmm. you know, for an hour we all give everybody 10 grand or whatever it might be. So some of the unintended consequences probably aren't healthy. They're just not good. So I could see where we get to the tournament Mm -hmm. and some teams that may end up with some really good players one way or another Mm -hmm. uh, because it's so different than it used to be. It's a different model right now because uh, how you're trying to build your team right now Mm -hmm. than it was maybe a few years ago.
Yeah. And that, what you were saying at the end there kind of leads me into my next question of something I just can't get past is the effect it's going to, and maybe people don't care about this, but the effect it's going to have on a team's culture, the Mm -hmm. effect it's going to have on the 13th guy and how he saddles up next to the first guy who's also got a quarter of a million dollar dollar contract with, Uh, you know. Yeah. Here, here's what's interesting. It's a great question. So I've talked to a lot of uh, friends of mine. They're in coaching at the highest level in college basketball, and they're doing doing very well. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and coaches have had different philosophies on that. For example, I've talked to one coach who's probably their school's ranked right now. Maybe I think probably top five in the country for in basketball. His, in basketball, yeah. and his attitude is, I don't care if all my players get the same amount of money. The best player, we're, he's he needs the most money, and then we're going to find a way through a collective and. Although coaches aren't supposed to be involved in it, but yeah. you know that guy's going to have a whole lot more than the other guys. Yeah. Now I've talked to other coaches mm-hmm. who have said, "I don't, I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. I want every guy on my roster. If you come play for our school, mm-hmm. there's a collective set up, and in that collective, you know, there's going to be opportunities, maybe autograph signings or whatever it may be throughout the year, and everybody makes the same. Everybody's going to get a check for the same amount of money. Mm-hmm. So even though it's it's attainable to, for guys to make unlimited amount of money. I think some programs are going about it differently than others. Yeah. And that'll be interesting to see how that might play out. And then the other part of the equation is the transfer portal because, yeah. you know, again, like I could sign you, Maddie, you could pl- come play for my team. And mm-hmm. we might say that, hey, you know, the last person that played your position and, you know, through NIL money, they were able to generate $100,000. Well, mm-hmm. great. Now you come and maybe you don't get to play. Mm-hmm. And there's another program out there that, is going to tell somebody in your family, your high school coach, and says, hey, if she transfers to us, mm-hmm. we've got 200000 waiting for her. Yeah. And so, boom, coach season ends. Coach, I'm gone. Boop, I'm in the portal. I'm gone, and I'm heading to the next one. Yeah. So there, there's no real rules to it right now, and I think that's where most coaches and administrators in college athletics are frustrated. Because yeah. even in pro sports, you have a contract for three years, and the whole world knows what it is, and you're bound by it. Yeah. Uh, but right now with NIL – it's literally the wild, wild west. Yeah. I mean, it just honestly, it, it sounds, the, the money amounts, the deals, what you get for what, just sounds so crazy to me. And and I know it'll become the new norm, but I, personally, what I got out of a college athletic experience, a college scholarship, was I'm you know, debt free at mm-hmm. coming out of college. And I have a degree from an amazing university. Mm-hmm. And for that, that's like, I couldn't ask for any more than that. So just to think that it's like now we're in a time where they get all that and a bag of chips. Yeah. Of yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> what's hard yeah. too, Maddie, is it's, you know, when the NCAA, uh, at the time it was Mark Emmert was the president and they passed the NIL along with, with uh, allowing players in ba- men's basketball and football mm-hmm. to transfer immediately without having to sit out a year. Mm-hmm. And basically those were somewhat simultaneous, almost, the, almost at the exact same time. It really created some chaos involved in that mm-hmm. and the the guys that play at the high level of division one basketball and football mm-hmm. um it's a part of the recruiting process and it wasn't it was explicitly said that it can't be a part of the recruiting process although it cannot not be part of it. it's yeah. part of it it's it's yeah. if i'm recruiting you at some point you're going to ask me or the assistant coach or somebody, you know, like what, what's going on with it. And it's, it's a mm-hmm. part of it. You can't avoid it. Mm-hmm. And so what's happening now is um, the amount of money that, a, a, that an athlete can get through their name, image, and likeness, it's a part of the recruiting process. And that's where it's not healthy. Yeah. It's just not healthy because... Um, 18-year-olds. And what was yeah. illegal for a million years is now legal and just pay a guy money. Have yeah. him come play. And... Uh, it's just not the way that college athletics is meant to be. So hopefully it'll 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 stay because I yeah. think it's good. The kids can do that, mm-hmm. but there has to be guardrails at some play, sometime put up. I, I just think without guardrails, there's going to be accidents left and right. Yeah. So um, thinking of uh, freshman recruits that uh, are, you know, this is on the table now when they're entering their college scene mm-hmm. of transfer portal. Um, NIL deals. What's the the best piece of advice if you could speak to any uh, any mm-hmm. kid who's you know about to step into the college scene, um, college athletic scene? What would you want to tell them? Is just the most important. Thing? <clears throat> I would I would tell a young player, especially in the sport of basketball and football, and I think all sports in general. But I would say in those two because the professional 
money that's to be made one day is astronomical. Yeah. And you're talking about in basketball and football now, guys going into professional sports and a Patrick Mahomes can get 250 million. Okay, so that's a lot of money. That's different than 2 million or 4 million. Yeah. That's, that's generational wealth. So I think that the biggest piece of advice I would give to a young person in those two sports is you still wanna choose a school where you feel like you have the best opportunity to develop, mm. improve, and put yourself in a position one day where you can become that guy that can make that kind of money. In other words, don't eat hamburger now when eventually you can eat filet mignon. Mm -hmm. You know, th that's where your goal should be. And yeah, okay, this school, you know, their collective group said they can they can round up two hundred thousand dollars, and this one says they can round up seventy five thousand. Well, it still might be better for you. It might be a better opportunity for you. Mm -hmm to go to the school that may maybe their collectives aren't that big maybe there's not as much money for you because your goal is still long term yeah. generational wealth in those two sports in basketball and football and probably baseball where you have the opportunity to make that kind of money one day if you're a pro yeah um i still think that's what i would tell a young person mm -hmm. Just be thorough in the recruiting process. And I would yeah. stay pure to, now if all things are being equal in one school, there's the collective, there's an opportunity to make more money, sure. Mm -hmm. But where is the best place for you to go to develop, improve, and at the end of your time there, you're going to be the absolute best possible player you can be. Mm -hmm. that, that's really what you want. Mm -hmm. At that point in time, anything can happen. So yeah. You know, a smaller amount of money, you know, that burden of hand, I get a little bit more now, but that, that may not be the best thing for, for a young person. Yeah. Okay. Final question. Mm -hmm. um, in your thinking about your field of work that you were in for so long mm -hmm. as a head coach of a men's basketball team, who's someone in that same field of work that you over the years just whenever you saw them, whenever you you know watched their games or even coached against them, who's someone that you just always looked up to that maybe even, I mean, you've met and spent time <clears throat> with a lot of incredible people, but just anyone who just even made you nervous because you just loved the way that they coached and ran their teams. You know, it was interesting. There's so many coaches that I, I was fortunate to coach against. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I always used to tell people, I, I always had great respect for guys that had staying power, mm. guys that lasted a long time. And obviously Jim Beheim, you know, and we had him here on the podcast and, you know, he was, I mean, he just was there for a hundred years. It seemed like <laughs> the guy never left. And not only that was phenomenal through the whole, you know, he was never yeah. bad. He was always good. Yeah. Uh, Roy Williams was one of those guys mm -hmm. uh, for me. You know, was he had a, a North Carolina, and before that, Kansas. He had two amazing runs. And uh, you know, when I was coached at NC State, uh, you know, not that we became great friends, but we had, you know, I really admired and, and trusted and you know his word when we talked privately or we were somewhere. And he was very genuine, and uh, um, I got to know him a little bit differently, and always respected him. Mm -hmm. um, Jay Wright for me, is one at Villanova, won back-to-back -back championships. And yeah. Jay and I coached our Pan Am team uh, down in Rio de Janeiro one summer back in 2000, I think it was four, and I got to know Jay really, really well. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only a great basketball coach, um, but just a great guy as well. And yeah. Bill Self at Kansas is another one. You know, he's kind of went through a little bit of, you know, stuff with some of the NCAA, but just a phenomenal coach. And again, staying power, Tom Izzo at yeah. Michigan State. Yeah. Uh, Tom and I went to Iraq, uh, visited our soldiers um, a number of years ago, and got to know Tom really, really well and just admired him as a person. So, you know, for me, it's the guys that are really, really good coaches, yeah. but then also really good people, too. And that's the guys I really, really liked being around. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that is great. <coughs> uh, well, thanks. Thanks for uh, letting me uh, take the reins for a little bit. And, um, yeah, I'm just so excited for what you're doing here and happy that – we can be a, a little piece of it. So I think what we learned today is a star is born. Mary oh, is on no track way. to become the oh. new uh, anchor <laughs> uh, for ESPN. Watch out. Here she comes. Oh, so, man. Maybe. A lot Maybe. of fun today. Thank you, Maddie. Yes, of course.